There was a time where being human, more often than not, meant living in a certain kind of confinement. Over a lifetime, a person might travel to the nearest handful of villages without ever venturing further than a handful of kilometers from home. But these humans no doubt wondered what lay beyond their horizon as they heard vague tales of mysterious faraway places. When humans did travel long distance in the past, it was painfully slow. Marco Polo's adventures traveling to and from China, starting in Venice, for example, took 24 years. Members of the ill-fated Narvaez expedition of 1527 found themselves in the unenviable position of walking from Florida to Mexico, which took eight years, and out of 600 members of the expedition, only four survived. As humanity developed technology, though, the world contracted, and it's now possible to be nearly anywhere on the globe in a matter of hours rather than days, months, or years as in the past. Speed is good, but we're still confined to our solar system, more or less. How do we realistically reach the speeds needed for interstellar travel? Where do we get the energy to do so? My guest, Dr. David Kipping, has recently released a paper detailing one possible way we might do this efficiently by way of using black holes to aid in interstellar travel. It's called the Halo Drive, and represents one of the most exciting and compelling potential future means of travel I've ever heard. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Dr. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics, and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK Project. David Kipping, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me, John. David, you came up with one of the neatest conceptual ideas I've seen in years, honestly, the halo drive. And when I watched your, uh, I read your paper first, and then I watched your video on Cool Worlds, and it really fired the imagination. At its most basic, what is the Halo Drive? The Halo Drive is an idea to perform a gravitational slingshot around a moving black hole. But the really unique thing here is that rather than doing the slingshot with a spacecraft directly, the slingshot is performed remotely using a beam of light. And by doing so, one can avoid the need to have to actually physically get into close proximity to the black hole, which of course can be quite hazardous, and uh, accelerate your spacecraft. It could be an arbitrarily large spacecraft to potentially relativistic speeds without actually expending any fuel in the process. So you're essentially firing a laser at near the event horizon of a black hole, and you're hoping to gain energy from that. How does that occur? Yeah, so this kind of was a fusion of a few different ideas that I'd seen in the literature beforehand. Probably the best basis for this is to talk about something called a Dyson slingshot. So this was actually proposed by Freeman Dyson in the early 1960s. Freeman Dyson, I'm sure, as many of your viewers know, of course, very famous for the Dyson sphere and Dyson swarms, etc. these ideas of megastructures. But of course, he was very active in many areas. And uh, he had this brilliant idea that, hey, if you had a pair of neutron stars or white dwarf stars, two compact stars, which are whizzing around each other very close, 
then uh, the speeds are so high there that if you performed a slingshot, as we do in the solar system all the time, if you perform a slingshot just right, you can actually speed up your spacecraft to relativistic speeds. And maybe there is civilizations out there already using this. That was kind of Dyson's idea. Now, uh, the challenge with that, as I sort of alluded to in my, uh, in my opening remarks there, is the, is the hazard of the binary itself. I mean, this thing's moving so fast that you have to have exceptional timing, of course. You have to conduct the slingshot so fast that there's no chance that the motion of the binary itself leads to a subsequent collision or um, disruption of your path. You have to avoid potentially a, a hazardous radiation environment. And of course, there's the tidal forces. As you get close to a black hole, as you probably have seen in, uh, in science fiction films and things before, there's this idea of spaghettification. That, uh, and we actually see that as stars fall into black holes as well. They become ripped apart by the tidal forces. So all of those things make the Dyson slingshot a brilliant idea, but ultimately a hazardous idea to actually uh, attempt in the real world. I, I loved the idea though. I came across it on a blog and then I read the paper and I thought it was a, a beautiful idea. And I was thinking about ways that maybe we could do this more realistically. And then the other part of the puzzle, which really solved this for me was this uh, wonderful paper by William Stuckey in 1993. And he showed that, as you sort of mentioned there, that if you fire a beam of light or a photon even, just shy of the event horizon of a black hole, so not directly into the event horizon, just to the side, there is a specific geodesic you can choose that causes the beam of light to bend right around um, and thus behave like a mirror. And uh, the, the idea of a gravitational mirror is kind of a fun idea, but it actually has a useful application here. If you have a mirror which is moving very fast towards you, then you can bounce light off it and use it to ultimately propel yourself. So this, uh, we can talk about this maybe a bit more down the road, but then this gets into ideas of like breakthrough star shot and those sorts of ideas they've been thinking about for accelerating spacecraft recently. So essentially, all right, you're, you're firing a beam towards the event horizon and just skimming it off there and it, it sort of gravitationally warps around and the light, which you can't speed up light, but you can add energy to light, right? Yes. So you you are you are essentially blue shifting the light, and it comes back to you more energetic than what left your spacecraft, correct? That's right. That's that's how um, that's the slingshot component, I suppose. That the the fact the black hole was moving causes wants to cause the light to speed up, as you said, it can't speed up, and so actually gains energy through frequency instead. So this all, all together leads to three effects. One, when you fired your beam, you your spacecraft would have felt a slight momentum push in the opposite direction. And that's just by Newton's uh, you know, law that every action has an opposite and equal reaction. So just firing a photon, even a, when you hold a, a flashlight and you fire the beam of light out of the torch, you do actually feel a very, very slight push back in the opposite direction. And then when that beam of light wraps back around and comes back to you, it strikes your spacecraft, and that act of it striking you also causes then another push. So there's two pushes that have been applied to the spacecraft, and that's ultimately what causes it to accelerate. On top of that, the third effect, as you mentioned there, is that the beam of light not only comes back to you, so you therefore get back all the energy you put in, but actually you get more energy out than you put in because the black hole has transferred some of its kinetic energy into the frequency of the light itself and therefore you can actually charge up your batteries on board your spacecraft. So you're talking about a moving black hole. So this black hole is 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 transferring energy through its movement. Now, do you necessarily need a binary black hole that's, you know, moving at extremely high speed or can you actually use a singular black hole that's just moving through space? That's a great question. That's something I thought about a lot in this because binary black holes, um, whilst they are common, there are something like probably 10 million in the Milky Way galaxy according to the latest statistics from LIGO, the, the requirement of a fast moving black hole um, somewhat limits you because of those 10 million, they're not all in the state of in spiral, only a small fraction at any one time are, and those that, uh, those that are in the state of in spiral and thus um, having these extreme speeds, they're short-lived. They're actually in there 
process of dying essentially. But at any one time, there is certainly a, a population of uh, nearly merging black holes in the galaxy. It's actually not exactly clear how many of those exist right now. That's something we, we should hopefully find out from LIGO. So it would be great if you could relax that assumption. And as you said, like, do you have to have a binary? Maybe you could make do with a, with a single black hole. There's two ways you could do that. The first and the simplest one probably to imagine is that stars are not stationary themselves in the galaxy and neither are black holes. They have their own peculiar motion through the Milky Way galaxy. And thus you may just have a chance encounter, locate a black hole, which just happens to be moving quite quick. We already know, for instance, of hypervelocity stars in the Milky Way galaxy. These stars are actually probably in the process of leaving the Milky Way galaxy because they're moving so fast, but there is certainly a population of such objects, fast moving stars, and thus by analogy, fast moving black holes. Um, so that could work. The Probably the more appealing way to do this, and this is something I really only touch on briefly in my paper because frankly the mathematics is quite formidable to, to really calculate this properly, is the idea of a spinning black hole. So in the paper I primarily focus on a Schwarzschild black hole, which is to say a black hole which is neither spinning nor charged, it's just simply a vanilla black hole. But there is a, another case which is often called the Kerr black hole, named after the scientist who first derived the metric to describe space-time around such black holes. And the case of a spinning black hole could also be used just in isolation to pull off this effect. And that's because of frame dragging. So as a black hole spins, it actually drags the fabric of space around with it. If you, This is kind of like a merry-go-round at this point. So if you fire your beam of light and it, let's say the uh, your black hole spinning in a particular direction, you come in it on the correct side, you can kind of ride the merry-go-round. Your beam of light can ride the merry-go-round for a short time. And the process of doing that of residing in this twisted space-time for a short interval should blue shift the light in a similar process and it would certainly cause it to have the same mirror effect that's actually already been demonstrated theoretically in a paper by Kramer in 1997. The calculation of what the precise blue shift would be as a result of this process as far as I can tell has not been calculated. It is something I attempted to, to look into, but it, it was quite clear early on it was going to be a formidable calculation. So I'm sort of maybe thinking of that as a, a follow-on uh, exercise in the future at this point. But a spinning black hole, yes, I, I believe it would also, um, you'd be able to use the halo drive. So what kind of speeds are we talking about? We're talking about accelerating a spacecraft to relativistic speeds. What, what I, I guess it would depend on the black hole and the parameters of that specific situation, but what, what kind of speeds could we expect from this? What percentage of the speed of light could be achieved with a halo drive? I mean, you're exactly right that it completely depends here on the configuration of the black hole itself. The maximum speed you can achieve to basically directly depends on the speed of the moving black hole. In the paper, I estimated with a theoretical calculation that it should be about four thirds of the speed of the black hole. So you might think naively it would be equal to the black hole speed because as the black hole is moving towards you and firing this beam of light, it should keep coming back with more energy until your speed matches the speed of the black hole. At that point, there's no more free lunch to be had because the beam of light will start to come back redshifted, i.e. with less energy after that point. So the halo drive starts to sort of fall off after that point. However, you can actually get faster than that, 33% faster than that, by now um, using all of this built up charge that you've acquired during your acceleration run. Because remember, during that acceleration, the beam of light kept coming back blue shifted, enabling you to charge up your batteries. And you can dispense of that energy, again, using the halo system to continue to accelerate. And the, the terminal velocity you can reach at which point you have still not expended any net energy at all is four thirds the speed of the black hole. So it depends on the black hole you're looking at. Um, certainly in the very final moments of Inspire or black holes reach half the speed of light. Um, so in, in that final moment, you could achieve, um, you know, very close to, to the speed of light kind of velocities. 
more realistically, you might be looking at anything in the range of 1% to 10% the speed of light for compact binaries. So, in other words, you can you can accelerate to seriously relativistic speeds if you have the right black hole. Um, now, so say you have something like Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Um, is that better? I mean, it, would it work? Actually, let me rephrase that question. Would it work if you had, instead of a binary black hole, you had some other situation like a, a neutron star? you know, orbiting a black hole or a or normal supermassive star that's orbiting. Could you still pull off the halo drive that way? No, unfortunately not, because the 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 requirement to create a halo, and I use that phrase halo um, because if you think about it, the beam has performed this loop. So if you looked out the window, it would kind of look like a, a, a loop of light or a halo of light suspended around the black hole. The, the requirement in order to achieve that is um, that essentially you have an event horizon around the object. If it was a neutron star, a neutron star is not able to bend light to such an extreme degree. It certainly deflects light considerably as it skims the surface of the neutron star. But you're basically asking here for a point which is, uh, or a condition which is, very, very close to being that the light simply falls into the object altogether, that it kind of can't escape, which is the definition of a black hole. And I'm essentially asking here for a condition which is just shy of that, because rather than falling into the black hole, the light barely escapes. It performs a 180 loop. Um, So you really do need an event horizon for this system to work. However, there may be other ways you could get the light to bounce back to you. I mean, obviously, we're using the black hole here as a mirror. So you could just physically build a a huge mirror um, to the same effect, or you can maybe exploit some other effect which could distort the path of light, such as a refraction through an atmosphere or something. Um, But of course, in those cases, you might expect there to be significant losses to the beam's intensity during such processes. The beauty here is that essentially the system's completely efficient. There's really almost no loss. So you have a, almost all of the energy that you put in eventually comes back to the spacecraft, in fact, a little bit more. It really is a, an elegant idea. I, I really like it because of its elegance. And on that note, we must take a break. So be sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications for this channel and Cool Worlds, which is David's channel. And today I'm joined by David Kipping of Columbia University. And when we come back, we're going to talk about creating relays of black holes, networks that you could use to travel the galaxy. Hey guys, Professor Kipping here. Thanks so much for tuning in today to hear about my Halo Drive concept. If you like hearing about cutting edge research in space and astronomy, then consider swinging on by our channel called Cool Worlds. I lead a research group at Columbia University where we discover and characterize new planets outside of the solar system, and we like to share our work through videos on our channel. Futurism fans will also enjoy our hard science takes on topics like artificial gravity, alien megastructures, the Kardashev scale, and more. Real science videos by real scientists. So thank you again for tuning in today, and I hope to see some of you over there at our channel, Cool Worlds. And we're back with Dr. David Kimming. David, now, the thing about black holes is that you're dealing with a really, really, really massive, massive object that could accelerate not only a spacecraft, but you could accelerate a planet if you really wanted to. Now, accelerating a gigantic spacecraft at relativistic speed, something that, say, it has the mass of Jupiter, would be no problem for the halo drive, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is kind of the one of the major advantages i would say of this of this approach the only requirement that you really have here is that the mass of your spacecraft is significantly lower than the mass of the black hole as long as you have that condition it doesn't really matter how heavy the object is it could be a gram mass spacecraft or it could be a jupiter mass spacecraft it will still feel the same effect of course the total time that you might need to accelerate for or the intensity of the beam would have to be modified accordingly but overall there's still a net zero 
um, in fact, an, a net energy gain for the for the for the spacecraft or the planet which is being accelerated. So as long as that as long as that's true, then it really doesn't matter um, how big your object is. So you know that's kind of appealing because when we talk about accelerating with the breakthrough Starshot, for instance, and we talk about accelerating with a beam of light, a grand mass spacecraft, you're talking about terajoules of energy in that case. That's huge. That's sort of running a nuclear power station for an hour or two at a time and then somehow storing that energy just to accelerate one gram. If you want to accelerate a space shuttle, which is about 2,000 tons, then you're talking about 100,000 years of running a nuclear power station for to sort of collect that amount of energy. So we really just don't have access to this type of energy level needed. Just the pure kinetic energy needed to accelerate these things is so vast. And thus kind of the inspiration in part behind the halo drive was, hey, if we can't generate that amount of energy ourselves, maybe we can steal it from an astronomical object, because after all, we are talking about astronomical levels of energy. And uh, these binary black holes certainly possess that. The one possible problem here is that we're fairly distant from the nearest black hole, thousands of light years away. So what do we do to get to the black hole? Yeah, that's unfortunately uh, an unavoidable downside and the major downside of this system. My intent here was really to try and improve upon what Dyson had proposed before. But both in his case and in in the halo drive case, if you're going to use astronomical objects to conduct your acceleration, then you have to be near to said astronomical objects to do so in the first place. So the analogy I kind of like to use here is like um, these these binary black holes or these spinning black holes, which are distributed presumably throughout the galaxy, they they could perform, and maybe we'll talk about this in a moment, sort of a highway system that you can essentially ride uh, in between the galaxy. But to ride that highway system, you have to pay the one-time fee, the total fee, to get onto that highway system. And that fee represents the energy cost to reach the nearest said example. And that's kind of an unavoidable aspect to this. So certainly that has got me thinking right now in my group and we're sort of bouncing ideas around about how one might be able to pay that fee using somewhat analogous ideas, but obviously not using a black hole, using astronomical objects closer to home. Maybe you can sort of uh, stay tuned for that. Hopefully we'll uh, make some progress on that in the, in the future as well. So. All right, we, we, we were talking about this concept of the Dyson slingshot using, you know, binary star system in order to accelerate, tw- and in this case, accelerate towards a black hole. Now, there's an elephant in the room. The closest star system to us is a binary star system, Alpha Centauri. Is it possible to use that to sort of slingshot using Dyson's method towards a black hole where then you, you know, transition over to the halo drive sure yeah you could certainly uh use you know a more conventional slingshot not the halo drive but just a conventional slingshot around planets in our own solar system or around um, a binary star this actually got me thinking i mean i made a sort of a comment on this uh, after my paper came out that if you were a civilization that was born around a binary star system especially a compact binary star system two stars orbiting fairly close to one another those things are very common, actually about half of all sun-like stars reside in such systems, um, then you would have kind of an advantage for interstellar travel because you could um, potentially achieve relatively fast velocities compared to what we can achieve by using the binary itself. However, the, it would not be relativistic because you know the, the sort of the fastest you can really steal off this is about twice the velocity of these objects. And if they're, unless they're really compact objects like neutron stars or black holes, they simply can't achieve those velocities because as the object sort of, as the binary emerges and gets closer and closer, they start to be in contact with one another. And of course that immediately makes the whole thing unstable. Um, So in order to get these things so close together, in order to achieve those very fast velocities, you really need a very small star, which is to say a compact star. So it would certainly help. It might give you a big boost towards your destination. But it wouldn't, it would, wouldn't be competitive with the kind of energy you could steal from a binary black hole. The other problem is, is that once you're, you use the binary black hole to achieve relativistic speeds, 
you have to be able to slow down. But you could also use the halo drive if you have another black hole that you're heading towards in order to slow down, right? Yeah, that's right. And it's um, a bit more relaxed in terms of the criteria there. You actually don't need a binary black hole to do that. It could be a completely stationary black hole. And you can essentially just use the same effect by throwing light to this object. Um, you could potentially speed yourself down in a, in a similar way as to the acceleration process. It's just sort of reversing the direction in which you fire the beam. So that would, in a way, what you've really done is you've taken energy from one distant binary black hole and moved it somewhere else in the galaxy to another black hole or another binary black hole, if you like. And uh, in that way, you have conserved energy. Uh, no energy was really lost during the process. It was just moved from one star system to another. So you're simply transferring energy. Now, say you were on the spacecraft and you were accelerating away from the black hole, a black hole. What would it look like? What would you see? Would it, as, as, you know, this halo of light that would result from uh, doing this method? Yeah, that's an interesting question. The, uh, I, I didn't really have the, I didn't spend too long uh, thinking about the visualization or, uh, or a simulation of what this beam of light would really look like as it loops around. Um, the calculations in the paper are mostly based off sort of looking at the geodesic of light um, rather than sort of doing like a Hollywood simulation of the visual effects. To my mind, you would have this um, point-like beam which you're emitting that would loop around the back and uh, come back to you. Now, in an ideal world, I suppose you wouldn't even really see the beam. Because if you could see the beam, that would imply that it was scattering in a medium such as dust around the black hole or something. And that, that's not good. I mean, this is actually sort of a relevant point to mention that some black holes have disks around them, uh, which is to say they have plenty of material around them. And that material would get in the way of the beam. And you kind of don't want that. Yes, it might make for a flashy light show of having the beam strike this material and light it, light itself up, but it would um, it would actually be bad for your halo drive system because you're now losing a lot of energy to the medium. So in an idealized case, you really shouldn't see the beam at all. It should just sort of loop around, come back to your spacecraft and um, push you gent fairly gently. I mean, kind of the rate of acceleration would be completely up to you. You can control it. And typically the sort of distance that you want to be to, to make this work is something like 10 to 100 times the event horizon radius of these black holes. And the reason for that is if you get much further than that, if you start being thousands or tens of thousands of uh, Schwarzschild radii away, then what happens is the beam is traveling on such a long distance that it starts to diffract and starts to spread out. Um, if that happens, then you're now losing a lot of your energy. So when you do this halo drive system, you, you kind of want to be in close, well, not super close proximity, but relatively close proximity to the to the black hole, but still far enough away that you should be safe from the tidal forces, for instance, from the black hole. So this 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 reminds you know to invoke sci-fi, you know, the movie Interstellar where you know you you bring someone from one point in the galaxy to another point which happens to be a black hole using a wormhole but the halo drive seems far more realistic than that that it's not as <laughs> it, there's actually nuts and bolts physics here that 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 actually allows it to happen now if you used the black hole all right to Accelerate the spacecraft. Does this happen in nature? Meaning that because a black hole, you know, obviously warps the, it, say it has an accretion disk and that accretion mm -hmm. disk is very active. Does it do the same thing to the light from the far side of the accretion disk? I mean, could you put a solar sail right next to a black hole or, or close to it and actually see an acceleration from just the accretion disk? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, thought. And it's actually something I, I, I certainly have been thinking about in relation to this idea. So um, in particular, I was sort of asking the question, well, what if you had a isotropic field of photons or even just a particle field that's passing through the system? What would happen? Now, what happens during the halo drive is that these, these particles or the spacecraft in this case is accelerated and thus it has stolen energy, essentially, from the binary black hole. And that's not a free lunch. That, that actually causes the 
the binary black hole to very slightly merge together, to lose some of its gravitational energy and come a little bit closer to, to itself. So what would happen if you just had a, not a spacecraft, but just particles or, or a radiation field in a system like that? I think that it would um, be kind of uh, similar to like a photon gas, if you like. It would actually act as a drag force on the binary black hole and cause it to in-spiral very slightly quicker than it would do if it were in a perfect empty universe. So um, this is kind of interesting because, you know, one radiation environment, which is all around us, is the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. Now, it's pretty pitiful right now. It's only about 2.7 Kelvin. Um, it's very difficult even to detect in a way. But uh, in the early universe, it was it was much hotter and much more um, significant. And it may have been that primordial binary black holes were um, sculpted in some part by this more intense radiation environment than what we have now. So it's actually something I've been sort of thinking about and maybe playing about with a follow-up paper for this is to calculate the effect of just... Um, of just not spacecraft, but just a natural environment, how it would impact the evolution of a binary black hole. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it brings in questions of, of natural pressure. You know, so say you have a, a meteorite or some, or well, a meteoroid or something like that, you know, could, could things be pushed at a certain distance away from the black hole by just the natural light pressure present? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the, the very subtle thing as to why this this, this might be expected to lead to a decay of the black hole, is that for, you can imagine our binary having two exactly opposite meteorites coming towards it, to use your analogy. So you have one that's coming in and being accelerated because it's heading towards a black hole, which is moving in an opposite direction to itself. And thus it should um, perf perform a slingshot and gain energy as a result. It kind of bounces off the bat, if you like, bounces off this moving wall and speeds up. Um, on the other side, you have a meteorite which is going the opposite direction, and it's moving in the same direction as a binary, uh, as, as the black hole component, and thus it's kind of trying to catch up with it. So when it bounces off, it bounces off very gently, and in fact, it actually loses energy in the process. So you have e equal and opposite, you might think, naively reactions happening. But actually, they don't quite balance out as a subtlety of special relativity. If you work through the math, it turns out that overall, the black hole loses in this exchange, and it has a very slight net loss. So this is kind of the, the premise of the idea here, that because there's a, the black hole ends up being the loser in this exchange, um, even for equal and opposite meteorites flying in, or even equal and opposite photons flying in, then overall, you might expect uh, even an isotropic radiation field to slowly decay the binary black hole. Interesting. So by stealing momentum, you ultimately, eventually, over very long periods of time, you destroy your own travel system. You, you've you stolen all the energy of the black hole. Yeah, that's right. The I mean, one of the possible techno signatures of this system, imagine there is a civilization out there which is actively using this. And that was always kind of what I had in mind. I mean, uh, it'd be great if one day we can do this, but it, it certainly seems some way off from us doing this tomorrow. But if there's an advanced civilization doing this right now, um, one of the observational consequences would be that we would observe black holes to be merging at a slightly elevated rate to that which we might expect naturally. Um, and uh, not only that, but the uh, eccentricity, the ellipticity of those binary orbits would also be distorted in a distinct way. They'd be distorted sort of pointing in the direction of where the preferred lanes of travel are in the Milky Way galaxy. You could even potentially back out what the, the pathways that were being used were. And when we come back, we'll get deeper into that techno signatures using black hole relay systems, time dilation, and could it even be used as a power source for an advanced alien civilization? I'm joined by David Kipping today, and we'll be back in a moment. If you'd like to support Event Horizon, you'll be pleased to know we've recently launched a Patreon link in the description below. Or alternatively, you can use your cellular telephone to scan the assemblage of squares on screen now. 
be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. And now, back to John. And we're back. David, so if you, let's talk about multiple black holes and creating a relay system to sort of traverse the Milky Way. If you have a halo drive and you go off in one direction and you need to slow down and make a stop at another black hole, then can you use that black hole to accelerate to another one and create a sort of relay system, a transit system of the Milky Way? Absolutely. Yeah, that's um, one of the appealing aspects, I think, of this, that the each binary or um, let's even ex say not only binary, but also spinning black hole is essentially a waypoint station where you can both use the rotational energy to break and also to accelerate. You can not accelerate in exactly every direction you want to go in. Uh, you can't accelerate in a direction which is perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, for instance. But you can uh, accelerate to um, more or less any other direction you want. The optimal will be in the direction of the plane itself, but it's quite possible to accelerate out of the plane. You just won't be able to steal quite as much energy by doing so. And thus, uh, this raises the possibility that perhaps there is a civilization out there which is leveraging this system. And of course, the appeal to them would be that it is economically very attractive because it doesn't cost any energy at all to use it. So presuming even if they invent a, a means of traveling to their nearest binary black hole with an interstellar drive of some kind, let's say a fusion drive or something, that's still going to have to expend fuel to get to that first example. So the, the great appeal here is that even though you've invented a way of doing that, you have this completely free, essentially, highway system from your perspective that you can ride and move across the galaxy even very large masses. So as long as you can get to the black hole, you're good to go after that. You have no, you essentially have free acceleration energy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that kind of raises the question about how one would potentially detect such a such a civilization and uh, that that's not going to be easy. This is this is by design an extremely efficient system which means no losses and it's those losses that are ultimately a means of us potentially detecting other civilization so it's uh even if a civilization is using this it's, it's kind of subtle as to how you would see them so but what about secondary techno signatures here so you have a civilization that's using black holes to traverse the galaxy but they might also be producing radio signals or something like that that could be detected radar even and that might make black holes an attractive SETI target, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the the fact that these are waypoint stations, um, if you think about how uh, human civilization sort of played out, that all of the central trading hubs tended to be at natural waypoints. And thus, it, it's not unreasonable that if these are indeed places where people are conducting acceleration and deceleration, then there may also be, um, uh, a, you know, other types of technology around those black holes as well of, of whatever type it is. So this isn't this isn't just isolated to the halo drive, by the way, as well. I mean, before myself, many others have pointed out that there are numerous advantages to black holes for an energy hungry civilization. You can essentially just throw your trash inside it, and out comes out pure energy. So um, either through Hawking radiation or by um, exploiting the jets, you can even do something called the Penrose process with spinning black holes. Um, there's, a, there's actually a number of ways of extracting energy from spinning black holes. So there's, there's numerous ways in which you could essentially either harvest the energy of the black holes that's already there or convert mass directly into energy around these places. And that's unique. There really isn't anywhere else in the universe you can do that apart from a black hole. And so I think it, it totally makes sense that we should be considering black holes as potential seats for advanced civilizations. In other words, maybe a solution to the Fermi paradox is we're pointing the radio telescopes at the wrong objects. We're looking at star systems when we really should be looking at black holes. Just simply because, I mean, imagine just the sheer amount of energy coming off a of black hole's relativistic jet. You know, imagine just the mm -hmm. massive amount of free energy that's available from that. 
So a civilization could basically park itself next to a black hole and say, well, we don't need our star system anymore. We can just abandon that. And we're going to just take advantage of this giant energy production object. And uh, we can exist for billions or trillions of years until the black hole actually evaporates. So... It would also be quite the sunset right now, or black it, hole set, it I would. suppose. <laughs> yeah, it, well, the black hole set, that was one of the interesting things about Interstellar was that they, they as a matter of fact, I think Kip Thorne was one of the, the producers of it, then they thought, well, what would this actually look like? You know, a black hole with a, an accretion disk. And it really was a compelling image, at least. Yeah. I don't know, yeah. you know. I guess we're going to I guess we're going to find out what what it what it really looks like with the Event Horizon telescope project but um but it really is a compelling thing because that's a lot of energy concentrated in one object. Now, when you travel at relativistic speeds, say you you've accelerated via your halo drive, you run into the problem of another cost, time, time dilation. So say you're traveling at 80% the speed of light. What would time dilation be like as you leave your black hole? Um, at, I mean, 80% of the light is, is very fast. At that point, you'd be seeing time, time dilation on board the spacecraft by a factor of, um, just doing the math here quickly, I think it would be about 1.7 times slower. Your clocks would be running about 1.7 times slower on board the ship. So. That's not actually, um, you know, when you watch Interstellar, they talk about every, what is it, every day being like seven years or something like this. It's like a, it's like a very extreme ratio. Of course, that's a gravitational well in that case that's causing the time dilation, not velocity. But in order to get that, that's that's kind of a very sci-fi idea to get that level of time dilation. Um, you really have to be traveling at 0.99999 sort of C for this to become something that um, is becoming kind of a mind-bending concept. And certainly if you're traveling at the type of velocities that the halo drive is, is really permitting, I'd say that's more in the range of 10 to 20% at best, then that, that's a very modest time dilation factor actually. It's only about 2% for a uh, traveling at 20% the speed of light. So this is not gonna be something which completely affect, you know, affects your 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 twin on the other side of the galaxy you guys would more or less be aging at still more or less the same rate it's a fairly modest effect so somebody after 80 years somebody might look just a little bit younger and that's the <laughs> that's the extent i'd still take it i'd still take that two percent if i was offered it as... <laughs> you know though the the thing is one of the questions uh highly speculative possibilities with an advanced civilization is that you could manipulate the the um, the rate at which your mind perceives time therefore if you're speeding up or slowing down how you perceive time then all of a sudden the the speed of light is no longer so much of a limit but in this case if you're going 80 percent it's not much of a limit at all because time dilation is not that pronounced i guess you you could say now, mm -hmm. um, but if you are an alien civilization that's traversing the Milky Way a lot, say you're a space traveler and you've used the Halo network 300 times, then you got a problem with time dilation. I mean, you might be a thousand years old, but you're, you know, you're, it becomes significant over very long periods of time, right? Sure. I mean, I think an interesting, uh, thought experiment with this is, is the hypervelocity stars that I mentioned earlier. So there are some rare examples of stars in the universe and in our own galaxy which are seen to be sort of whizzing out. Um, not quite, not at 0.8c, we don't, we don't have any examples of that, but maybe there are indeed some extreme objects yet to be detected at those kinds of velocities. And if you think about the, imagine there's a planetary system around that star, it would be aging as seen from the outside uh, you know, almost a factor of two slower than the rest of the universe. So it would be, uh, you, it would almost, almost be like a time machine. You'd be able to see an example of what the universe might have, or planetary systems might have looked like, almost going back in time, say, seven, six or seven billion years into the past. Um, so, yeah, the, you can certainly play some interesting games. Maybe it's uh, particularly good fodder for science fiction stories, the idea of time dilation. But if you're traveling at a, 
sort of point one to point two C, this is probably not going to be um, a complete game changer for you. So ultimately, what is the time frame? Do you think? I mean, if if we decide to go and take advantage of this Halo Drive system, and we, you know, we 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 trudge off to a black hole, how far in the future is this? How you know how when would the human species be able to take advantage of this? Um, yeah, that, that's difficult to, to make a, a certainty degree of guess about. I guess I would say that um, the, the Halo Drive offers an extra incentive, if you like, to trying to reach the nearest star or the nearest stars around us. Because once you can accomplish that, it's not that much harder to actually traverse the entire galaxy using such a system. So when we will achieve that first step of being able to reach the nearest few stars is going to really lock in when we're going to have the ability to, re to achieve the halo drive. The halo drive, as you said earlier, is it's kind of simple. It's just using known physics. We're not warping space time here or generating gigantic magnetic fields or anything like this or superconductors. There's none of that. It, it really is just a laser, 1970s technology. But the exotic element is that you have to be in close proximity to one of these black holes in the first place. So we could do it today if we if we had one nearby, technologically wise, it's not a limitation there. The the next step and certainly something I'm excited to start thinking about now is how can we reach that first object? So yeah, yeah, and ultimately use it to to traverse the galaxy. But let me ask you this. Could you is it cumulative, meaning that could you go the opposite direction and not decelerate and just continue to accelerate moving black hole from black hole to black hole? How fast could you ultimately get if you if you were just slingshotting around trying to achieve speed? Could you get almost to, you know, we can't get to the speed of light, of course, but almost to it, you know, just a fraction away from from it to where you're really experiencing relativistic effects. Is it possible to cumulatively traverse black holes like this and build speed. That's a really interesting idea. Um, that's actually not something I'd, I'd actually have spent too much time thinking about, but I really like that idea. Yeah, it's certainly, we do that in the solar system. Uh, when we do um, a deep space exploration with New Horizons and um, the Voyager probes, they indeed um, exploited cumulative gravitational assists to build up velocity and to also affect their trajectory to some degree. So yeah, if you had the, the right alignment and um, went through the calculations, had your map of where all of these black holes are, all of these compact binary objects, I don't see, uh, I think off the top of my head, I don't see any obvious objection to you being able to compound those velocity gains um, and uh, keep going up to very close to the speed of light potentially. So that's an interesting idea. I guess if you were interested in reaching the nearest galaxy andromeda for instance that might be an appealing way of achieving that so you might be able to get into intergalactic travel with the halo drive sounds like you should be a co-author on the next paper john <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> oh, I, I should probably be more of an author of another book but <laughs> <laughs> on that note we are out of time david if, if for anybody that wants to know more about the halo drive david did an excellent video on his channel cool worlds and check that out where he goes even more in depth about the Halo Drive idea. And David, this is one of the coolest ideas I've heard in a long time, man. I really enjoyed reading your paper and I wish you luck. And I hope you'll come back next time when you release another paper. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Stay tuned. We have a few more interesting ideas like this up our sleeve here. So look forward to sharing in the future. And we love interesting ideas here. Perhaps in the human far future, the Halo Drive will be the means that we use to colonize the galaxy. It's always been said that galactic colonization is possible, though a slow process at sublight speeds, but still possible. And one of the mysteries of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is why anyone hasn't done this yet. The Milky Way is well old enough for someone to have done it many times over. Perhaps we are simply looking at the wrong galactic real estate. Maybe quiescent, long-lived stars aren't where civilizations ultimately go, and our study searches should instead be focused on black holes. But as far as our own future is concerned, imagine what it would be like to travel by way of the halo drive, 
Imagine a black hole behind you providing an energy boost by way of blue shifting light sending you on your way at relativistic speeds directly towards another black hole. By using that black hole in the same way, you can slow back down. Though I can't imagine heading directly towards a black hole at relativistic speeds will ever not seem unsettling. John, why are we spending $250 per month on, and I quote, JMG Beard Maintenance? This has to stop, John. We're supposed to talk about the show, Anna, not your bean counting. Why are you so concerned anyway? That money could be better spent on things like electricity, or towing the car. Sure thing, Anna, I'll make sure that's paid for. With your beard money? Leave my beard out of this. It's going grey, John. Accept its entropic decay, and move on. I'm not going grey, my beard is merely sick, and joining me next week will be astronomer Christian Reddy, host of Launchpad Astronomy here on YouTube, for a discussion of the far future of the universe and life around a red dwarf. See you then.